Guys, how are you? Uh, welcome back. Let's continue from where we stopped. Uh, I've discussed uh, simple group accounts consolidation. Okay. Um, so the, the tricks usually that come there is usually at uh, how you compute uh, the percentage to determine whether you have control or not. And for that, at least I've covered because that's the hardest part. They give you the number of shares, then you're supposed to determine the percentage. Then uh, on a normal day, I'll give you the percentage. I'll tell you straight that you acquired 40, 70%. Okay, so that's for simple groups. All right, that's what uh, can be had in step one. Step two, which is a uh, net asset summary of the subsidiary. Uh, usually they bring in things like the fair value of uh, net assets was in excess. Maybe 10,000 or 2,000. Now, if that's the case, that's where the trick comes in. Now, if it is, um, if the asset we are referring to is land, then it also becomes fairly easy. Because for the land, you're interested in the fair value. I can explain that as I show you what you would have done. Some screenshots of the financial position. All right. Um, yeah. uh, you can take those. As you're taking, I can be explained here. So uh, where can the difference come in on step two? Step two, they will tell you, like I've already said that, they will say that uh, the fair value of particular assets was in excess or in different to the current amount. So if it's land, for example, if you have, um, using this example, uh, let me remove this. Okay. So for land, for example, we're saying that if there's uh, fair value adjustments, if we had an excess in land, say of 2,000, of course, it will come here under, under acquisition, so say of two. Okay, then if there's, there's any revaluation later, maybe the land was again revalued yeah, to three or to four or by three, Okay, if they said by three, then it would come here. Okay, the, the reporting it would change. But where they're selling after revaluing, then the reporting balance will be two still here. Okay, now it's the two here because they want you to go to the statement of financial position. Now you come statement of financial position, this side under PPE, and you add that value. The four, you add it. It's actually two. You add the two on this, you say plus two. Right, and you'll be done with that part. Now, assuming it was land, I mean building, which depreciates, how would we go? How would we go about it? Okay. Assuming it was building, I'm just uh, giving you scenarios here. Okay, so for building, assuming it was still two, the excess. Eh? Maybe before I say the excess, if it was land, and maybe it decreased in the value, it's a negative two rather than rather than a positive, okay? And they were silent, they didn't tell you anything. If they're silent, the reporting balance must be the same as negative two. And I was saying it's a negative here. So when you come to your statement of financial position, you will deduct it to be a minus two instead. Okay, that is if you had a deficit eh? like that. Now, assuming that uh, it's not land, it's building. Building and it's depreciable, and you have a uh, say again. Building okay, there was an excess of maybe two still. Okay, that's useful, be different. 
Okay, and they've said that at, at that date, maybe the remaining is for life was uh, two years. Okay, so what happens is the reporting change is not the four, but rather the carrying amount of the four. So the carrying amount of the four comprises of the cost, which is four, and it's automated depreciation. Okay, so how do you reflect that? Uh, we say that this for life is, is what? Is, is um, two, and therefore we're saying our depreciation would, be, would have been four divided by two, giving us a two. Okay, so meaning that our carrying amount, let me let me make it a four, is for life, let it be a four, so that's not similar figures. Which means it was a four, the is for life, remaining is for life is a four. So our depreciation will be that four, this amount here, the excess, which is four, divided by the remaining for life, which is four, and you have one eh, as your extra depreciation. Now, it's a depreciation. You can show it as a single line here, or a single line, or you can show it in the carrying amount. So in the carrying amount will be a three here at the reporting date. So and therefore the movement, you have a movement of a negative one. Right? So you have heard of uh, assets uh, being in excess and it's uh, depreciated by nature, and then you're confused about it. So this is how we go about it. You bring the excess at acquisition, then for the reporting date, you first depreciate this excess here based on the remaining is full life. So in this case, we said our is full life. Um, let me push it aside. Our remaining is full life was actually four years. So uh, assuming the period, the post acquisition period is one year, this is how we end up having the one and therefore our carrying amount will be the three. Okay, cost minus depreciation, which will give you a three. And so will be your movement. So how would you close up this whole thing? Now you would go to your statement of financial position. Okay, and just bring the three. What you put on the reporting, you just bring it here as a three. Okay. Then the one which is the movement, this one here, okay, the negative. You'd go under group retained earnings, under group retained earnings. Uh, where? Yeah, under group retained earnings, and you say uh extra appreciation. Okay. Is arising due to the excess revaluation. So you bring it here, it's depression, so it's a negative, negative one. Okay, that's how you deal with it. Then you add, of course. So that's, that, those are really uh, the best tricks I can think about under what? Under working number two. Okay, so let's go to working number three. Uh, working number three, which is the goodwill. Usually it's on really the consideration here. Okay, they talk about the cash consideration, talk about the uh, share exchange, okay? So for share exchange, share exchange, I can talk about it briefly. For share exchange, I've heard people say, if they say one to two, just say one divided by two, okay? Which I think works for some, okay? Times the number of shares acquired, number of shares acquired. Okay. Although with me, I prefer that I put here my parent and I have a subsidiary, then we are looking at the ratio we are sharing, we're saying it's a one to two, and then we're saying how many shares we actually acquired in the subsidiary, say 80,000 like they were in this case. And then I'm asking how many did I give away for these shares? I don't know, okay. Then I cross my apply. So I have two X being equal to the 80,000. Therefore my X will end up still being the uh, one divided by two times 8,000, 8, okay? Which is the same thing, just like, but personally, I prefer doing it that way. Because my apply, this is how it look like. So then you get the number of shares, I think yeah, there will be 40,000. Okay, now, people are asking, at what value do you revalue this? What you give away is what you have actually spent on buying, okay? What I give away is what I've spent on acquiring something. So I'm giving away my 40,000 shares and the market value of my 40,000 shares is what I'm giving away. 
So you look at the parents market share okay, of the shares. So what you attach on the shares that they gave away, that will be the value of the share exchange. Okay, I hope that we get on that. Then there's deferred. Uh, for deferred, you uh, we know that you're supposed to find the present value. Okay. Deferred means that you agree to spend money in the future. Okay, to pay someone maybe in two years or three years. So we say that is deferred. So we ask ourselves, how much do we pay now? Okay. And we're saying it's present value. In present value, we all know it's future value. Okay. Uh, one plus R raised to the power negative one. If you don't want to do this, negative N, sorry. You don't want to do this, you just say, uh, which is the same as future value, divide by one plus R raised to the power N. Okay, you have the same thing. So this is how we compute for deferred. Now, after getting the value, the PV, that is what becomes your consideration. And that's what you put here under your considerations. Okay, then you add, if there are any other considerations, you add them together. Then for NCI, at least what we have seen, if for the NCI is given, put the value given. Okay, if it was 50, put 50. If it's not given, then you compute for it like we saw. You get the percentage of the NCI, times the fair value of the net assets acquired from working number two. Okay, what you get here under working number two. All right, so those are the, the few things they say under working number three, goodwill. But we are, but what are we on now? Uh, we're going to do associates. Okay, we're going to just do associates. Not even doing it, I'm just going to, because at the end of the day, if you know this, for associates, just add it, it's a single working. Okay, so what we are doing is basically, it's going to give you, I'm giving you highlights on what you expect in case they bring a number like this. Of course, if Frank brings a number like this one, he want to bring um, straight things like they were here. Okay, you, you will find somewhere you have revaluation or an excess in the building. You find that consideration of goodwill is probably you have deferred contingencies and all that. So I'm talking about them briefly to prepare you. If you're preparing for this number, try to read those, okay. Uh, David, I hope I've answered you. Then um, that is it. Then under inter, uh, intercompany transactions, those ones you, you're aware. You have uh, inventory, they say markup or margin. They'll tell you that a quarter percent remained, or they'll tell you that 40,000 of worth of goods remained. So look out for those numbers and try them out. Uh, then for balances that I've shown you, the shortcut is you list them the way they are, the balances. Payable, receivable. Bring the balance, the balance. Then remove them, pass the opposite entries. The balance becomes the bank. Okay. Uh, yeah, that is it. That is it. So let's go. Let me talk about the associate. I don't have a number here, but the idea is for an associate, you say that you look out for um, uh, 50%. To 20 percent, is it 20 or 30? Uh, I think 20 percent, yeah, 20 percent, okay, more than 20 percent. In between, you have an associate. Okay, we say you have an associate if you have what we call significant, significant uh, influence. Okay, if as a parent you can influence. If you're parent, you can influence um, a particular entity, even if you don't have 50% or more of shares, but you have few, but you can influence decisions. Okay. Then we say associate. How do you know that you have uh, significant influence? There are indicators of this. The indicators include things like um, are you probably one of the suppliers, one of the largest uh, suppliers? Or customers of the entity. One of the customers, the largest customer, actually, one, the largest customer, if you're the largest if you're the largest customer of the entity, then you're asking an influence. If you you are represented, represented on the board 
board of directors. Okay. Then you have significant influence, among others, as you read in the theory. Okay. So for associate, <laughs> uh, whenever they bring it, they'll bring you a group account, which is the normal subsidiary, then they bring an extra. Now the extra once you have a percentage less than 50%, then it's an associate. The treatment of this one is treatment. Okay. The treatment is, of course, for the group structure is such that you have a parent, then a subsidiary, and then you find that the associate is outside the group. Uh, associate, maybe D. Okay, so you have a group. Okay, and then you have one outside. Okay, but related to P, eh? P controls uh, D. So in that regard, I'm saying that the treatment is that uh, you have a working, working old associate. Okay, it can be anything, but it's an associate that working. Associate, you have uh, the fair value, okay, of the associate, mainly structure the investment that you have in associate, not necessarily fair value, the cost of investment. In the associate, you bring the figure, okay? Then uh, what you interested in also is the share, share of post acquisition profits of the associate. So if they say that the associate made the profits for their 20,000 and you have 30% of it. So just bring the 30% here, okay? Assuming 30%, I think 30% of um, the profit of the associate, it's the only thing you bring. Okay. So the associate is also affected by um, PAP in case you sell between yourselves. So it also affects this thing. Less profit, in case it's an intercompany transaction, also we remove it. Okay. And then if there's an impairment, okay, if there's impairment of the associate, we remove those. Okay, and then you get the final. Now the final becomes your value of associate and under your balance sheet for the parent and uh, after the intangible asset, the goodwill, you put associate. Then you put this figure here, this total. Okay, then in your retained earnings uh, group, retained, the way it is here. For group earnings, you just bring here the share of the associate, whatever came from associates thingy. This figure here that you got, this one, this, you bring it under group retained earnings. That is just basically to complete the double entry. Okay, and then you're good to go. Now let's look at uh, complex groups. Complex groups, um, what you know in your simple uh, groups is very important. Okay. How we compute for NCI, how we compute for group return earnings, how we compute for intercompany transactions, the goodwill, it is very important. You borrow it or you bring it here. Okay. What makes the difference is that here you have more than maybe one associate, one uh, subsidiary, you have two of them. Okay, but they don't differ very significantly, I can assure you. Okay, once you know the other part, this one becomes easy. Okay, now for flex uh, complex, we have uh, vertical groups. Then you have um, the D shapes, D shaped groups. Okay. Uh, I wanted to show the contrast. So let me put it here. See the difference. We shall have simple groups. Simple groups. Then you have a complex. Complex is a big thing. Complex and a complex is saying have vertical. Then you have D shaped. Then under simple, you have a subsidiary, subsidiary alone. Then sometimes you have associates. I've dealt with these two, so let's see the vertical. 
for the vertical, this is how it arises. You have a subsidiary. The conditions are for the vertical to arise. You're saying that uh, a parent controls, say, subsidiary one. Okay. Then subsidiary one controls subsidiary two. Okay. Now, if you have a relationship like this of three individuals, okay, I have the parents S1 and S2. This is what you call a vertical group. Okay, now it arises, it arises when all the conditions are met. Okay. When all these are met, that's when it arises. That uh, if S controls uh, S2, and the parent doesn't control S, there's no vertical group. But where the vertical, where the parent controls S and S controls S2, regardless who came first, that is when you begin um, having a vertical group. So a true example or illustration would be that you have P here, then you have S1, then you have S2. We're saying both associates. Okay, uh, someone should mute, otherwise opening pages. Okay, so you have, uh, it must always be more than 50%, so you have 60% probably. Can you just give me a sample? Then maybe you have 70%. Here. Okay, this is the vertical group, but P is what is um, a parent of S, or controls S1. S1 controls S2, now we have a vertical group officially. A P controls S2 indirectly. Now, let me give you another scenario. Another scenario is you have a P. Let me just copy and paste. Okay, you have a scenario here. Okay, that P controls S maybe 70%. But S does not control S2. Then control S2. Probably it is um, uh, maybe thirty percent. Okay. Now this can't be a vertical group because a uh, parent must have an indirect control with S two through S one. Now if S one doesn't control S two, then parent can't have control by S two. So that's what you call vertical group. All right. So let's look at the D shapes. How would it look like? The D. It is such that um, you have a parent controlling, there must be a control, right? controlling S1, right? And then S1 does not have to control S2, but it has shares, hmm? has shares, let's say controls, or has shares. So it doesn't have to be really control, okay? And then the same parent again, the parent above has shares, has shares in S2. Now, once this is a scenario, you shall have control. But this, this arises on a condition that when uh, you combine, when parents, parents share, parents share, and the uh, S1's share in uh, S2 must be equal, must be greater than 50%. Okay, that's when the D shape arises. That the parent must control S1, S1 must have shares or control S2, and the parent has shares or even controls S2. She has shares. As she has stroke controls S2. Um, so where there's no control, when you add the parents and this S1's thingy, it must exceed 50%. Let's illustrate that. So you're saying you have P, then you have S1, okay, and then you have uh, S2, right? So we're saying if uh, I'm going to use lines. So you're saying if this guy controls, he must control. The first one must be control. 
So for control raise, it must be more than 50%. Assuming the 60%. Okay, let me put this side. 60%. Okay, then S1 has shares in uh, S2. Okay. Assuming it is what? It is maybe uh, 30%. And then D, okay, I don't have the better of putting this one, uh, except passing through the side up, up. So bear with me. Uh, so you have something like this. Okay, it is directed and maybe has 40%. Okay, are these conditions, are all the conditions made? One is that you have a subsidiary already, which is a good thing. Okay. And we are saying the subsidiary must control S2 and the parent must not control it necessarily, but have shares in S2 and P must also have shares in S2. So as long as this, uh, when you add the 40% of the parent and you add the 30% of the S1, yeah, as long as um, it's greater than 50%, then you have a D shift. Group. Okay. So, uh, help me make sure that you have understood this part before I try out a few scenarios. Okay, are we together here? Okay, because if we are, then we can try out some. Let's not try out the ones in class, the ones that you have in handout. Okay, if you go to page um, uh, okay, let's begin with this Sandra question. I'm not going through the entire thing. I'm just going to show you how you get, especially the control bit, and guide you through and how you compute it. Okay, so for purposes of time, uh, then yeah, let's let's look at uh, for Sandra. Let me see if I can share the image. So maybe as I share the image, eh? the other thing is, uh, when do you know that you have, or when does um, the D group and the vertical group take effect? Okay, just to emphasize, because I already said it briefly. So we're saying on the date, on the date, on the date when all conditions uh, start getting met, start. Okay, the first time, I think the first time, the first time. How do I mean by that? Um, what I mean is, you see now like it is for, uh, for Peter, I mean for P and S1. If P acquired S1, say on 1st January 2020, okay? And then S1 acquired S2 on 31st December 2020, okay? I'm saying we have, we have a vertical group 
on the first time they met. So the first time the three conditions are met, you will agree with me that it is 31st December 2020. Okay, because on 1st January 2010, S1 hadn't acquired S2 yet. So there's no way you can have a vertical group at the time. But on 31st December, uh, we have a vertical group, reason being that all conditions are met, that P has 60% in S1, and S1 has 70% in S2. So it's basically control, uh, full control on 31st December. So let me try another scenario. Assuming this also had a control, maybe it's 55. 55. It's still also This is a vertical group. Because you have a uh, parent controlling S1 and S1 is controlling S2. Okay, now assuming that um, S1 had acquired his uh, thing on 1st July, 2021, okay, S1 had acquired 2021. Then S, then P acquired S1 much later, probably on uh, 30th of, of uh, September, 2021. That's not much later, but it's later still, okay, 2021. Now the effective date you're saying, we have a vertical group, we have, A vertical group on the day when all conditions are met. And you'll agree with me that uh, here it can only be what? That is September. Okay. Because on this date, whereas S1 controlled S2, yes, but uh, there was no parent controlling S1. Okay. The parent came later. So when it comes later, so now the parent can prepare officially. Uh, the groups, the vertical group. Okay. I hope we are finding the same thing that we're applying here applies for the D. Okay, when all conditions are met, the date when all conditions are met officially is when we consolidate. Okay, so I've, I've uh, shared the question, but I can still share it here. Excuse me. Yes. Excuse me. Mm. For that part of the the date of acquisition, mm. when it was the, the subsidiary mm. to first acquire another subsidiary, say, on 1st Jan 2011. Hmm? Mm. Then, but they said it had the even the like earnings, but on 1st Jan uh, in another year, mm. the parent acquired that subsidiary. You said it, you said it what? The first one is? It was the subsidiary to acquire, okay, S1 to acquire S2. Mm, which date? On 1st Jan 2011. Mm, with the returned earnings of 40. Mm -hmm. Then on 1st Jan 2012, mm. the parent acquired that subsidiary one. Mm. And also on that same date, he acquired S2. Mm. Now that one is different. That one is now the what the D group. Once once you see a parent having some shares in a particular company that mm. its own subsidiary also has shares in, eh? that comes in. Mm. Okay. So maybe to answer that question. So we are saying mm. that um, the sub S1 acquired S2 on 1st January. 2011. Okay. Then on um, on first January, first January, was first January, yeah, first January 2012. Mm. Then the parent acquired the subsidiary. So what's the percentage? Assuming okay, it's 60 percent. After all, can only become subsidiary when you have more. Okay. What was the percentage here for S1 and S2? Okay, I think I've gone off. Assuming it was 40%. Okay. Okay, it is amount number of shares. Ah, okay, so it's supposed to compute. Right? Yeah, we are but, supposed uh, to compute. Okay, assuming you compute and these are the percentages that you're getting. Yeah? Then you're saying on the same date here, on 1st January 2012, the parent acquired 
shares in S2. Mm -hmm. So assuming it was maybe 20%. Okay, so this is a D group, ideally. That's what they were saying. It's a D group. Right? So let's see how we can now uh, how we get the net controlling interest and stuff like that for both vertical and the D group. Okay. So I'm going to use the um because someone should mute. Uh, there's a bias. I already, already muted you, but you're getting unmuted yourself. Um, so back to what is the question? Okay, send it. Let me share it shortly. Andrew. Yeah. My point was on the retained earnings. Hmm? Hmm. Which one for the subsidiary and the one parent acquired it? Which one do we take? So for the retained earnings at acquisition date, you're supposed to determine the retained earnings for both the subsidiary S1 and subsidiary S2. So as you realize, they gave you for retained earnings for S1 acquiring in S2. So they gave you the retained earnings for S2 on the date when S1 acquired S2. Now that's not our problem. That's not our issue. Actually, we're not even interested, but maybe helpful in case you know, given the retained earnings for the date of acquisition when the parent took over control on both. Okay, so usually you have to compute a few things. Uh, unfortunately, maybe you share with me the image. You take a picture, share with me, I discuss it here. Okay, I will just go on WhatsApp shortly in case you share. So you take a picture, share with me, I show you how you use it. But ideally, on the date when the parent acquires the asset, Okay, on the date when the parent acquires the asset. Alicia, is it true? Alicia, kindly remove the video. Hmm? Um, I was saying, on the date when the parent acquires control in both is the date you're interested in, and that's the date of acquisition. So if you're given sign earnings on that date, it's what you take for both the S1 and S2. Okay, usually whenever I want to give you for S2, there's always supposed to use the one that they had before to compute for it. Okay, so you share the image, I will, I will gladly help out in case you haven't understood what I've said so far. Okay, so um, now there's this question of, um, what was it? The one of um, Sandra and uh, Tiveke. Uh, let me share the image here. Okay, it's going to close shortly. So let's join shortly in a few. Otherwise, this thing is closing. But otherwise, um, for this, we're saying okay, Sandra, as you can see, it's a vertical group because uh the parent is investing in Sandra, then Sandra invests in another entity. So you're seeing the relationship. Invest in one, then the one you invested in, invest in another. So chances are higher, it's a vertical group. Okay. And it's otherwise. Uh, but let's see, let's see in a few, because the link is going to close it. Eh? 